Love God bless your souls. You may be seated this evening. And so uh, my name's Tom Golden. I'm the lead pastor here at River Life Church. And so thank you for coming tonight. And we have a wonderful word about to be given by Pastor Keith Turcott. He's not going to take long. And then I'm going to take three hours. So don't blame him. You can blame me. So I'm excited about that. But uh, God has something especially for you today. So believe that and receive that. So by way of introduction, Pastor Keith, his lovely wife, Lynn, have been in motorcycle ministry. Come on up, brother. Have been in motorcycle ministry for 20 plus years. They pastored for 15 years, got sick and tired of that, and decided they'd do motorcycle ministry. And I couldn't be more happy and we could not be more blessed by having Pastor Keith Turcott. God bless you, and thank you for coming this evening, my brother. God bless you, Tom. <laughs> hey, it's good to be with you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Can I borrow one of these? It, would it be okay if I take... Oh, you got another one? Oh, the table. Perfect. And I can just... Uh, thank you, Jen. Yeah, thanks for coming out. It's good to be here in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, worship team, and everybody that came out prepared and uh, blessed us with that this evening. So, wanted to be here for the event, and this is sort of a prep for tomorrow, the bike blessing that we're going to have. And uh, I, I just think it's really good to start something like this by having a little get-together and praying and worshiping and getting in the presence of God, and then just an encouraging word. Um, and, I, and I've got something God has uh, laid on my heart. Um, it might be new to you. It might not be new to you. But in motorcycle ministry, and, and most of you here are a part of that, and thank you for what you do. Thank you for uh, giving yourself to that ministry. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people do not know about motorcycle ministry, and, and some people know about it and don't understand it. But it's all about just relationship that we build with people, and we try to share what God has done in us and for us and, and be transparent and allow people to see that, you know, in their lives uh, as, as bikers or motorcycle riders, there, there's, there's both things. There's bikers and then there's motorcyclists. Uh, there are those that live that culture and there are those that just casually ride whenever they get a chance to do that. But, but everybody is still just people. And everybody is, how, do you, how many know everybody's looking for something to fill a void in their life? And uh, one of my favorite messages that I've ever heard preached was by... Uh, the Rolling Stones, back in the late 60s, they did a song called, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And I share that just about everywhere I go because it's so true. And, and I love that song because Mick Jagger said, I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried, but I just can't get any satisfaction. And it only comes when we get Jesus in the center of our life. That's the only thing that's going to give us that satisfaction. And until that happens, we're going to do all kinds of things to fill that void. Uh, and motorcycling is one of them. But, it, it, you know, it's not something you have to give up when you get saved. Uh, when, when I got saved and became a Christian and then became a preacher, I still wanted to ride my bike. And what I found is that it was a great icebreaker to start conversations with people. And uh, so God has given me numerous messages right out of his word that apply and they are so relevant to the, to the ministry of uh, motorcycling. And, uh, and I want to share with you a little bit and I want to go quick because I want to give Tom just as much time as he gives me. But in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, there's a scripture I'm going to use to launch right there. Excuse me, chapter 2. Just the first verse in chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. It says this. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And, and I like to use that to tell people something uh, and maybe just clarify that Jesus didn't come for good people and Jesus didn't come for bad people. Jesus came for dead people. 
We were all dead. The Bible says we were all dead in trespasses and sins. And we know that Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that was me. And probably you. Amen? Amen. And so God sent Jesus to come for everybody. And the religious people of the day, I don't think they understood that. And I think there are some religious people today that don't understand that. That they don't know that Jesus came for all of us and it doesn't matter what we look like on the outside. Uh, you know, I like to tell people this. Jesus loves us all just like we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. He's got a better plan for our life. Amen? I mean, when he found me, I was lost and undone. I was riding motorcycles. I was a drug addict, alcoholic at a very young age. And I'm not going to go into all that story. But he saved me just like I was. He accepted me just like I was. We can't clean up and get our act together before we come to Jesus. That's why we need Jesus. Amen. He came for the sick, not for the well. And, and I was really sin sick. But Jesus came for me because I was dead in my trespasses and sins. And I want to use that to launch into the Old Testament. I want to give you a scripture here, and maybe you've never heard this before. I've had a lot of people come say, man, I've never, never heard that scripture used in that way before. But I really feel like this is the way it was intended to be used in the book of Ezekiel chapter 47. I'm going to start with verse 1, and then I'm going to go down to verse 8 and read a couple more verses there. But Ezekiel was having a vision here. God was showing him a picture. And, and I'm just going to read it. Some of you will be familiar with this. It says in verse 1, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the front of the temple faced east. And, and that's very important that we note that the east is the direction that the water was flowing in. It says it was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. And now I want to skip down to verse 8. And it says, Then he said unto me, This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. Can anybody guess what sea it is that the waters are going into? If, if you do a little study, you look at the maps, a lot of the Bibles have maps in the back of them. And if you look to the east of Jerusalem, there's a sea over there, and it's the Dead Sea. And that's where the water was flowing out from the temple. And now I want to pause with my reading just for a second and say this. In this, in this Old Testament picture, this vision that Ezekiel was having, we, we know that this was in the Old Testament, and a lot of people don't, don't understand what this really was pertaining to. But if we jump over to the New Testament, what is the temple in the New Testament? What, what do we talk about in the New Testament is the temple? Us, right? We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and, and if we look at the book of John, I'm going to jump over there real quick. And, and just share this with you. In the book of John chapter 7, Jesus was speaking here. He was preaching to a crowd. And he said this in chapter 7 verse 38. He said, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Okay, so we read in the Old Testament that there were living waters that flowed out from the temple. And they flowed to the east and they went to the Dead Sea for a purpose. And it said whenever those waters reached the Dead Sea, those waters were healed and it brought life. How many know there's a reason they call it the Dead Sea? There's nothing alive there. It's too salty. My dad told me he actually, when he was in the military, he got to swim in the Dead Sea. And he said you could literally just sit there and float because there was so much salt in the sea there. And so... What this is saying is that the waters were flowing purposefully to the Dead Sea. And in the New Testament, we see that Jesus said, For those of us that believe, out of our innermost being will flow living waters. 
Now, where are they going to flow to? They're going to flow out to other people. And in and, and the title of my little message here, well, let me go back to Ezekiel, and I'll give it to you. It, it brings it out right here in chapter uh, 47, verse 9. It says, And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the rivers go will live. And there will be a great, a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there. For they will be healed, and everything will live wherever the river goes. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi to Eneglium. And if you look at the map, you see that those two cities, one is on one side and the other is on the other side of that body of water. So what he's saying is from coast to coast, there will be fishermen lined up around the Dead Sea. Now think about that for a minute. Who in the world is going to go fishing in the Dead Sea unless it's people like you and me? Because we just read over in Ephesians that everybody is dead in their trespasses and sins. And he's talking about fishers of men. We are the people that God has called to go out and allow the living water to flow out from us into the Dead Sea And we're lined up around the Dead Sea fishing for people that are lost and dead. And we are the fishers of men. Jesus called his disciples and said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And it's a crazy thought to think that people would be lining the edge of the Dead Sea to fish when there's nothing there. But the reason it is is because when the living water goes there, it brings the dead to life. You see, it's not anything that me or you can do. It's not anything that these fishermen in the Old Testament could do, but it's the living water that God sends that flows out from the temple, which is us, the temple of the Holy Spirit, flows out into the Dead Sea and reaches those lost people. But it's only going to happen if we go fishing. If we don't go fishing, we're not going to catch any fish. You know, I, I heard a guy one time doing a seminar on fishing. And he had studied every aspect of fishing. He knew about temperature and barometric pressure and what bait, what line, what kind of rod, uh, where to fish and all the different. And it was mind-blowing how much he knew. And somebody at that seminar raised their hand and said, Sir, what is the biggest fish that you have ever caught? He said, Well, I've never actually caught a fish. But he could teach about it. He could tell about it. But because he'd never actually gone fishing, he'd never actually caught a fish. And I thought about that, and I thought that reminds me of some preachers I know. They preach a lot, and they talk a lot, but they never actually go fishing for men. The church is full of people that have never gone fishing for men before. What has God called us to do? Once we get saved, he's got a mission for us to accomplish. And that is to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Sometimes use words. Amen. But you know what I found out in this ministry? People would much much rather see a sermon than hear one. And so what they're looking for is they're looking for somebody that has got something that works. That satisfies Remember Mick Jagger, man, he tried and he tried and he tried. And I thought, man, if Mick Jagger couldn't find something to satisfy him, what hope do I have? The guy's got all the money in the world. He can have houses and lands and cars and bikes and whatever he wants. But he can't buy salvation because it's free. But what he don't have, I have it and you have it today. Aren't you glad that you don't have to be rich to have it? But you can be just whosoever will come to the Lord and say, Lord, I I need you. I want you. I want you to fill up this empty spot that I've got right in the middle of me and give me some satisfaction. And I can tell you that I got it a long, long time ago. And now I'm getting gray-haired and bald-headed. And I'm still excited about the fact that Jesus resurrected me, a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old man is dead and gone. And he made all things new. And I want other people to know that what he did for me, he can do for them. And all we got to do is share our story. 
You know, you don't have to be a card-carrying preacher of any kind. All you have to have is a testimony. You can tell them what Jesus did for you, and he can do the same thing for them. Man, I am almost done. It says, it shall be that fishermen shall stand from coast to coast, and it, there will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kind as, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. Now, I'm going to close with this. We know that there was a place in the New Testament that, that Peter, James, and John, they were fishermen. And they had been out toiling all night trying to catch something. Tom, they, I don't know what they did wrong, but they weren't holding their mouth right or something. But they were trying as hard as they could, and they couldn't catch anything. And Jesus was there on the shore, and he saw them. They didn't know who he was. But he said, have you caught anything? No, we've been trying all night. We haven't caught a thing. He said, well, cast your net on the other side. And when they did, there were so many fish they couldn't get them pulled in. And I said that to say this. We can't just do it our way. We've got to include God and allow him to be the one in charge of what we do. We're going to go tomorrow out and do a bike blessing. I have no idea what's going to happen. But I believe that if we invite God by his Holy Spirit to be there and ask him to let that living water flow into that parking lot out there at, at McDonald's. I've seen, I've seen it happen. I've, I've had prayer meetings at Walmart, at gas stations, at rest areas. I've seen people get touched by the hand of God. And it's not because of me. It's just because I went fishing. But the real fisherman is him. Amen. And, and if the Spirit of God shows up, anything can happen. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll plant some seeds tomorrow. Maybe there will be some people that, I mean, you can't even plant seeds until you break up the hard ground of their heart. There may be some people that we're doing that with. But whatever the case may be, whatever phase or stage that we're involved in, we're asking God to do what only he can do. Amen. And that's, I don't know about you, but that's why I'm here. And I'm glad to be a part of it, and I'm glad you're here to be a part of it. And I'm glad Tom Golden is hosting this. And it's his turn to get up here and speak right now. <laughs> Worship team, would you please come? Oh, I promised you, this is going to be fast and furious. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you. Thank you Jesus. <clears throat> as the worship team comes, please, right now, ask God to uh, do something mighty in your life. If you've never asked that before and you're not even sure... What I'm asking of you, I'm at, here's what I'm saying. I'm saying, say these words. Dear Jesus, help me. Lead me. Guide me. Save my soul. Heal every fiber of my being. In Jesus' name. Amen. Apostle Paul was headed toward Damascus. <clears throat> and on his way there, he thought that he was going there to accomplish God's work. He thought he was doing the right thing. This is an entire big old story we don't have a whole lot of time to get into. I'm not going to take the time to get into it. The bottom line is there are times and places in our lives where we think we're doing the right thing, we think we're on the right track, and this is what's going on in our lives, and this is how we're going to write it out. And, but then there's these times in our lives when God speaks to us in a mighty way, and we, we can clearly see that it's Jesus. We can clearly feel that God is moving in our hearts and our minds. At this particular time, the Apostle Paul was headed toward Damascus. He thought he was doing the right thing. And he became what's called 
thunderstruck. The light shone. God's voice spoke. The people standing around really weren't sure what was going on, but the Apostle Paul looked up and said, Lord, Lord, is that you? He could clearly understand at that moment in his life that Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, was speaking to him. He was, by all stretches of the imagination, he was headed in the incorrect direction in his life. He was so religious that he had fallen off the deep end. So tonight, and sometimes I don't even share that part of his story because it doesn't matter if you're so zealous for some sort of old-fashioned style God or some other God that you're so chasing after that or what you think or where you believe or whatnot. Or it doesn't matter tonight if you don't believe in God at all. The bottom line is sometimes Jesus speaks to us in a way that we know it's his voice. We can see him clear as day. And we become thunderstruck. Thunderstruck means just surprised or kind of in a shock or an all. Or it's a point in our life where we see Jesus for who he is and what he is and what he has going on in our lives. The Apostle Paul's story is his story. And I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg there. But your story is your story. And I'm not saying that you're headed in the wrong direction or anything like that. But you might be. Tonight you could be in the middle of your faith walk and you're distraught, you're upset, angry, anxiety, or you're full of anxiety, depression, whatever it may be. You're not sure if you're coming or going. Tonight Jesus wants to shine the light on you and in your life. The concept of thunderstruck is to be surprised or be kind of shocked or in awe. I, I want to be in awe of what God has for me in the future. And then guess what? It's so fitting. <clears throat> the very short story in the Apostle Paul's life, he ends up writing most of the New Testament, went on three missionary journeys, took a trip to Rome, became a martyr for Jesus Christ. His, in li- his entire life changed. And guess what? As Pastor Keith was preaching, and I love that story, and how you shared all those details and led up to the people fishing around the Dead Sea. That's exactly how the Apostle Paul ended his life. He was one of those people surrounding the Dead Sea, fishing for people. Sometimes he saw fruit, sometimes he didn't. But he would go from town to town, he would plant churches. And Keith said he's met plenty of people, preachers included, that preached a good message, but weren't really fishing for other people. The Apostle Paul, when the light shone on him, when he became thunderstruck, he changed his entire mentality. He would go from town to town, and he actually uh, was a craftsman. The Bible says he was a tent maker. When you look that up, that means all kinds of different things, and we can argue about that in the foyer later, what he, what he did for a living and what that looked like how he received cash for his trips and all that. It's fun trivia. The bottom line is he went from town to town and God made a way for him to make his own way. And Pastor Keith said, sometimes, I would say all the time, most of the people, especially, and I've seen Pastor Keith and Lynn minister in their element in different places, actually all around the United States. And what Keith said is very true. Most people, they're, they're not interested in hearing a message. They're interested in seeing one. And the Apostle Paul, when he went from town to town, people saw the message. And when you read through the New Testament and his writings, some people even, I've even heard Christians say that he was arrogant and boastful. And some of the writings that he wrote shouldn't even be in the New Testament because he was so arrogant and boastful. But guess what? He wrote it, and it's in there, and it's in the canon of the Bible. And he taught us how to live because he was producing, he was showing the gospel. Even when he didn't have the words, even when he was trapped in a prison, he was still showing the gospel. That's what Jesus is asking of us tonight, I believe. Based upon Pastor Keith's word. Based upon, actually, I didn't even know the song that the worship team is about to lead us in. This worship song called, I Surrender All. You see, in order uh, for us to get to a point in our life where we so-called see the light... We have to surrender all. 
when Jesus Christ shone the light down to the apostle Paul, he surrendered all. <laughs> he surrendered all. He had to. He had no option. I'm asking you this evening to surrender all. And I'm, I'm not even trying to take a guess at where you may be at in your faith walk. We're video recording this. And you may be watching this online. You may be here in person. But I also want to say maybe even don't pay no never mind right now to the Apostle Paul's story or the person sitting next to you, their story. I just want you tonight to be thunderstruck by Jesus Christ. What does that mean? To be shocked and all, to be enlightened, to see his light. I don't want you to see my light and I, I don't want you to hear a word that I'm saying. I want you to hear what Jesus Christ is saying in your life. I'm just another talker. I'm up here, mamma, mamma, mamma. But I want you to experience God in a mighty way tonight, and that's very possible. If you're watching online, wherever you're at, could be daytime, could be a year from now or ten years from now. And to right this moment, I want you to surrender all. I want you to surrender all. The Apostle Paul had to. In order for him to get to the Dead Sea and fish for people. Peter, James, and John, they all had to give up their occupation of fishing for fish. And they had to go fishing for men, the Bible says. Fishing for people. That means they had to actually start living this Christian life. Not just talking about it. I love you. Jesus loves you. And all tonight, all tonight, he just wants you to be in awe of his glory of his light of his goodness, his grace, his mercy his conviction you see when God convicts our hearts sometimes it's a little unpleasant sometimes it can even feel like a scolding but that's okay it's fine with me I'd rather be told what's right and wrong right now and right here so that then I can turn my eyes toward God and do what's right follow the path that he has set for me would you please stand with me this evening our worship team has already done an excellent job and I know they're going to lead us into some worship could I ask you tonight not to look to be entertained I mean we have some in my personal observation, my personal and professional perspective we have some magnificent voices musicians one of the things I've always loved best about our worship team is their, their heart of worship tonight I'm asking you not to look to be entertained but allow Jesus right now to speak to your heart this is not between me, listen very close this is very interesting tonight is not between me and you and Jesus it's just between you and Jesus. And that's my hope is that tonight you and Jesus can have a, a good talk, a good experience. Tonight, would you surrender all and allow Jesus Christ to shine his light on you that you might turn and shine your light on others? Pastor Keith does what he does with his motorcycles because that's his lure. That's his fishing lure. It's a motorcycle. It opens up conversations so that others might see the light. Tonight, could we be filled with the light of Jesus Christ by surrendering all and then see what he has for us in the days and the months to come in our lives?